Um, and I hope you enjoy this, uh, our time together. Uh, before I get going too far, I want to let you know that I have a website and the address is here, dimagine.com. And on that website, there's any number of resources that you might find helpful, uh, including resources directly related to this uh, presentation today. I have a practice I call Imagine after the John Lennon song, and what I do in my work is I spend time in various places meeting people who have what are called difficult behaviors. Now my definition of a difficult behavior is that you do something that you wish other, that other people wish you would stop doing. Um, but most of the people I meet in my practice are people who experience disabilities of one sort or another, and uh, people across the age uh, spectrum from very little ones to people who are grown up well into adulthood. And um, a good number of the people that I meet in my practice have difficult behaviors that are of concern. They're hurtful to themselves or hurtful to other people. But my work is to spend time with people and get to know them and get to know the people who are supporting them uh, in an effort to build a support plan. And this workshop, Seven Questions, is really about the foundational questions that I ask when building a support plan for people. Uh, my starting assumption is that all difficult behaviors result from unmet needs. The very presence of a difficult behavior means that something important that the person needs is missing. And the question is, what is it that the person needs? One way to get at this is to insert the word need into all questions of why. So not why does a person hit others, but why do they need to? Not why does a person run away, but why do they need to? Not why does a person hurt themselves, but why do they need to? basic assumption is that the behavior itself serves a very uh, significant function for the person. It may be several things that, uh, several needs that are met by the same behavior, but we'll explore some of that here. A tool I use sometimes to help people uh, think about this is we develop a history of the behavior. So we create a simple timeline, as you can see here on the screen, uh, where we put today's date on one end, on the right-hand side, and then I ask people, when was the last time that things were good, or at least better than they are now? Um, uh, and usually people can think back to a time when things were pretty good for the individual. So, for example, uh, this story I will share with you today is about a man who has Down syndrome who had been doing quite well, but then became quite aggressive. Uh, he was being aggressive to his parents, and he was being some aggressive to his support people, particularly when he was in a car going somewhere. He would get aggressive, and people were wondering why, what, what happened. And when I asked them when were the last time that things were good, they said, let's say, uh, November of 2015. And then I asked the question, what happened next? Uh, I usually ask this question in a very open-ended way, but this asks people, what happened next? And people put on their thinking caps and they think back. And more often than not, it's about a change in relationships, a change in important relationships in the person's life. And the reason for this is fundamental to this work that I do. The foundation stone of my work is that ours is a social brain and we need to be connected to other human beings. It's critical to our well-being. And the problem for lots of people who experience disabilities is they're on the outside of what is in. A researcher, her name is Naomi Eisenberger, conducted a fascinating study years ago. And I'm just going to tell you about this one study lead you to some other resources that you might find helpful in thinking about how organized our brain is around social relationships. First of all, many neuroscientists, people who study the brain, now tell us that about 80% of what our brain is up to at any given point in time is thinking about social connection. 
In short, it's not something we do from time to time when we get a moment here or there. It's something we're doing almost exclusively. Eisenberger conducted this fascinating study that had huge implications for the way we think about the human brain. Uh, it was all at once quite simple, but the results were incredibly profound. What Eisenberger did, she and her colleagues did, is they asked a group of people to come to her laboratory to participate in a study, but what she wanted them to do is to play a game called Cyberball. And Cyberball is a computer game that couldn't be more simple. It's literally an electronic game of toss. She asked participants to come and play this game of electronic toss with two other people she said were in the laboratory who were also participating in the study. Now this turned out to be a fib. There really weren't two other people in the laboratory. It was actually each individual and a computer. But Eisenberger and her colleagues deliberately wanted each participant to believe there were real people that they'd be playing this game of electronic toss with. Uh, but then, to make it even more interesting, she got folks to lay down on one of these machines called a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. These are remarkable machines. Uh, but what they do is you have to lay flat on a bed and it submerges you into a kind of tunnel. And then the body is bombarded with magnetic impulses, hence the name functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. And for reasons I don't understand, I'm no scientist, when our bodies, are, our cells are bombarded with magnetic impulses, the hydrogen atoms in the cells line up. And when they do line up, they give off a radio signal, again, for reasons I don't understand. But these radio signals can be read as very strong or very weak signals or something in between. And then using very sophisticated computers, scientists are able to uh, create images or pictures of what's taking place in the deepest regions of our body without having to open us up. And Eisenberger and her associates asked people to play this game of cyberball laying on one of these flat beds. There was a screen overhead and they had a mouse in their hand. Uh, before the game even began, the participants said out loud things like, oh, I'm terrible at these video games. My kids are really good at these games, but I have no eye-hand coordination. Before the game even began, they felt awkward. They were worried that they would embarrass themselves, not only in front of the researchers, but in the game that they were playing electronically with two other people who turn out not to be real people, but they didn't know that. And then for five minutes, Eisenberger and her associates watch each person's brain as they learn this game quickly, and apparently it's very easy to learn. But then after five minutes, the computer is instructed to leave them out. So the other two players continue playing, but they leave the third out. And then Eisenberger watches the brain. And what happens in brain after brain, person after person, after just five minutes of playing this video game with two people they don't even know who turn out not to be real people, is the brain responds in exactly the same fashion as the brain would respond if somebody punched you in the nose. It's not a similar reaction, but exactly the same reaction. A region of the brain, it's called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, fires away, as you can see in this uh, slide. And when it does fire away, scientists know a lot of what it means. Among other things, for example, chemicals are being sent into the bloodstream that are designed to reduce swelling in tissue that isn't even taking place. There is no swelling in tissue. The body hasn't been physically insulted. You haven't been punched in the nose or hit behind the leg with a board. But the brain body complex is acting like there's swelling in tissue. Chemicals are sent into the bloodstream that are designed to reduce pain. There has been no, been no physical insult, but your body's acting like you've just been smacked in the face by someone's fist. And it all happens after playing a video game with two people you don't even know who turn out not to be real people, but you don't know that, playing it for just five minutes. Now, Eisenberger asks, 
Well, geez, if that's how our brains respond when we're left out of a video game with two people we don't even know, what would it be like if we knew them? Or what would it be like if it was somebody we loved who didn't love us back? Or what would it be like if it was someone we loved who passed? Well, what scientists were able to show for the first time ever is the mechanics of loss. And what we, they showed is that being left out hurts. It physically hurts. Now, we've known this for a thousand years or more. It's a part of how we express loss is I have an achy, breaky heart or I hurt from head to toe. My heart is broken. But now, for the first time, scientists were able to show the mechanisms for this. Now, why I talk about that study is because what epidemiologists now tell us is that being lonely is on a par with smoking two packs of cigarettes per day as a hazard to your health. Two packs per day. Uh, what we know about people who are socially connected is that they live longer and happier lives. They get sick less often, and when they do get sick, they get better faster. What we know about people who are socially connected is that if they need to take medication, they're more likely to take their medication as prescribed. They're less likely to have underlying mental health issues. They're less likely to have problem behaviors. It isn't even a close horse race with people who are lonely. Another way of saying the same thing is to say that people who are lonely uh, will not live as long and have as happy a life as a whole. They will get sick more often, and when they do get sick, it'll take them longer to recover. They'll be less likely to take medication as prescribed. They'll be more likely to have underlying mental health issues, more likely to have problem behaviors. It's not even a close horse race. What I've come to believe is that the root of suffering for many people who experience disabilities, whether they have mental retardation, as this gentleman I'll tell you a story about has, or whether they experience autism, I believe the root of people's suffering is not so much their experience with disability, but rather the isolation that often results from the experience of disability is at the root of their suffering. I meet people all the time in my practice who don't have a friend in the world. Some people were sent away to institutions in their childhood, away from their principal relationships in the name of treatment. I meet people who, uh, if they have a friend in the world, it's their brother or sister or mom and dad. Uh, but their life, as their brothers and sisters who are typical in their development get larger, their life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's at the root of their suffering. It's the most common reason why people exhibit problem behaviors is that they're lonely. So when we thought back about this gentleman who, let's say, lost his or, or started to have trouble with his behavior back in November of 2015, when I asked the question, what happened next, people said that he uh, um, had lost his grandfather that about March, of, or, or I'm sorry, um, October of that year, he had lost his grandfather. Uh, and it turns out he was really, really close to his grandfather. He and his grandfather were inseparable in some ways. And his grandfather was a person who could help him to understand complicated things in the world uh, like nobody else could. So now he loses his grandfather. He not only loses somebody who adores and he loves, but he also loses one of the people who can help him to understand complex things like grief. What we know about people who are grieving is that a natural part of the grief process is for people to become aggressive. But when it happens in a guy who has Down syndrome, we begin to think it's about Down syndrome or an underlying mental health issue. The next thing you know, people were messing with his medication when in fact it was about grief. When people who are typical in their development go through grief, they often get grumpy. They may not hit the person next to them, but they get pretty grumpy and can be hateful to one another uh, until they help kind of connect the dots. So the first question we asked is, what happened next? When things were last good, what happened next? And in his case, as is the case for many people I meet, it was a change, a fundamental change in relationships. Now, sometimes it's not about um, someone 
uh, leaving or passing, but someone new arriving. This is particularly true in group living situations or day activity centers or places where people gather. Somebody new can come and change the entire social dynamic and often at the root again is a change in relationships. The next question we ask sometimes has been, has there been a change in the person's physical health or sense of safety? Now, this gentleman didn't experience any changes in his health, but lots of people that I meet in my practice do. Uh, most of the people I meet who have complex support needs, who have been resistant to treatment over time, uh, a big reason is that they have underlying physiological conditions going on that are uh, uh, the root of their difficult behaviors. A way to figure out, is it an underlying physiological issue or is it something going on environmentally is to use a thing called the scatter plot diagram. This is a scatter plot diagram for a woman who would hit her cheekbone pretty routinely. We were trying to figure out why. Was it an underlying problem like a sinus infection or allergies or a migraine headache? What was going on? And in this case, uh, using a scatter plot diagram, uh, what we did is we just put, as you can see, the time of the day starting at 7 a.m. and this one goes to 6.30 p.m., but there was a scatter plot for the latter part of the day as well. And you can see the days of the week, Monday through Sunday. And every time she would hit her cheekbone once, uh, we would make a simple triangle in this corresponding square. So you can see on Monday at 7 a.m., she woke smacked her face once, and we just put a simple triangle there. Uh, if she hit herself twice, we would color half the triangle in, and at 10.30 on Monday, you can see she had hit herself twice. And if she hit herself three times or more, we would color the entire triangle in, and you can see that there are lots of times where the entire triangle is colored in. Now, for those of you watching this broadcast, um, if you were to look at this, uh, and I asked you the question, is this environmental or physiological? I'm hoping some of you would say it's environmental because you'd be right. You can see that one way of knowing this is you can see that the behavior really concentrates around particular hours of the day from nine, for example, until about 11.30 and then in the afternoon. And also notice from this same chart, and by the way, we took this for several weeks and they all look something like this. But you can also see on Saturdays and Sundays, the behavior just doesn't appear very often. Now, if it's an underlying physiological problem, then chances are it's gonna bother you on Saturday or Sunday. If it's a sinus infection, for example, you don't say on Friday, well, I won't bother you until Monday morning, I'm, I'm gonna take the weekend off. Uh, so when you see a, a pattern that looks like this pattern, it's often really strongly suggestive of an environmental issue, something you might ask, what's going on during those hours of 9 until 11.30? And also fruitful uh, question to ask is, what about those other times where it doesn't appear very often at all? What's going on between 12 and 1, for example, or between 4 and 5.30? Uh, it's uh, often we concentrate on the times of the day when the behavior is most difficult, but some of the best information I've learned over time can be learned by paying attention to when the behavior is not occurring. Who's there? What's taking place? What are the task requirements if there are task requirements? What's the noise level like? Uh, any number of issues uh, can surface from there. Now, this is a scatter plot diagram for a person who had a similar self-injurious behavior. And uh, if you look at this pattern, it's difficult to see a pattern. It seems quite chaotic. Uh, if I were to ask you to take one more week and predict when this behavior would or wouldn't happen, it would be a more difficult task than the first list. And usually when the pattern appears this way, there is an underlying physiological problem or perhaps a psychiatric issue going on for the person. But if you look at this, it's really difficult to predict when it's going to take place. It's pervasive. It doesn't matter who the person's with or what they're doing. They're having trouble. So if you had an abscess tooth, for example, chances are the pattern will look something like this. It doesn't matter who you're with or what you're doing. 
and the abscess tooth doesn't take the weekend off. On my website, uh, there's a chart there that you can find under a, quest a, a, a link called Seven Questions. And this chart just shows some common problem behaviors and speculation about their underlying physiological or psychiatric causes. Um, so you can see people, for example, who have an uneven seat, who might be in hip pain or have genital discomfort or rectal discomfort, um, people who are biting their hand or they're uh, putting their hand into their mouth might have sinus problems or ear problems. You can take a look at this. These, uh, this, these two tables on the website, you'll see it's two pages. Uh, they're not meant to be diagnostic tools, obviously, but they are just meant to help people think outside the box a little bit when a person engages in these problem behaviors. So back to this idea, when was the last time things were good, at least better than they are now? For this gentleman with Down syndrome, it was November, let's say, of 2015. And when we asked what happened next, we found that his grandfather has passed. He also asked the question, has there been a change in the person's physical health or sense of safety? Another question you might ask is, did joy leave the person's life? For this gentleman, he was an avid fisherman. He and his grandfather were avid fishermen. They both lived to fish. A bad day fishing was a better day than doing anything else. Uh, so not only did he, when he lost his grandfather, not only did he lose a man he loved in the world, a man who could help him understand complicated things, but he also lost a great source of joy. In my experience, often there's not enough joy in people's lives. They don't have enough to look forward to. And in this gentleman's case, when he lost his grandfather, he lost this enormous, enormous source of joy. Another question you might ask, has there been a fundamental change in the person's power and control? Now this gentleman, uh, he was a little difficult to understand sometimes when he spoke, or at least I had trouble understanding him. Um, I got used to the way he spoke over time, but even knowing him much better over time, I still sometimes struggled to understand what he was saying. But apparently when his grandfather was around at his meetings, and his grandfather came to all of his meetings, his grandfather was like a communication ally. And his grandfather would always ask him if the people in the room weren't understanding him. His grandfather would always ask, is it okay if I explain? And only with the grandson's permission would the grandfather then explain. So one way to think about it is not only did he lose this man he loves um, who could help him understand complicated things, who he shared this common joy of fishing with, but he also lost some power and control over things like these meetings. Uh, his grandfather was an ally, and when his grandfather left, his ability to let the world know what he was thinking um, also changed. Another question you might ask is, has there been a change in the person's capacity to contribute to others? Uh, we need to be needed, and this grandson um, was needed by his grandfather in some very powerful ways. His grandfather apparently had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and it had gotten more and more difficult for him to manage things as time went on. And this man with Down syndrome would help him unload stuff from the truck into the boat and launch the boat at the dock. and. Uh, he was critical. There was a joke uh, that the grandfather had that I have a stand-up grandson. My own boy, I can't get to do anything for me, but my stand-up grandson, he, he helps me. And this gentleman with Down syndrome took a great deal of pleasure in helping his grandfather. It was absolutely critical to his well-being that he be needed by his grandfather. Finally, a couple more questions you might ask is, has the person lost important skills or do new circumstances require new skills? Uh, many people I meet in my practice, uh, their life changes pretty dramatically and they end up in environments uh, where there, a lot of things are expected of them. This happens commonly for people who get jobs in supported employment. Uh, they leave a sheltered workshop and they go to a new job site 
and all of a sudden there's a bunch of things they don't know how to do. Our social brain wants first and foremost for us to fit into the new environment, and only when we're confident that we fit into a new environment can we settle down to learn things. Maybe all of you have had the experience where you got a new job somewhere, and for the first week or two you walked around and you couldn't remember anything people had told you. Uh, you go have a meeting and as soon as you leave the office, it's in one ear and out the other. You've forgotten what did they just tell me. And you have to go back the next day and apologize and say things like, I know you told me this yesterday, but for some reason I've just forgotten. Well, the reason that's happening to you is because your social brain is first and foremost wants to have a sense of connection with the new people in the workplace. And until it does, it really can't l settle down and learn things it needs other things that you might need to learn. Once you get confident, once you meet a maid at the new work site, a person who you think, I can sit and have lunch with them at least, we share some things in common, your brain settles down and it's easier to learn new things. A problem for a lot of people who experience disabilities is we underestimate what being excluded routinely in their life has meant and coming to a new workplace uh, where you really want to fit in is quite a charge on the social brain. When people form a connection there, uh, they settle down, they'll be able to learn all the things that they need to learn to do the job successfully, but a big part of it is, is new circumstances require new skills. If I don't have those skills that embarrass myself in front of the new pack, I feel overwhelmed and anxious. Sometimes people need to learn formal means of communication. It obviously helps a lot when you can express your feelings routinely and predictably. Uh, sometimes people need to learn coping skills. There's any number of skills that can be really helpful. And when you ask what happened a long time ago, why did things start getting worse? One question you might ask is, has the person lost important skills or do new circumstances require new skills? Finally, the question you might ask after you create this timeline of the problem behavior and you ask what happened next, you might also ask, has there been a change in the support needs of the person's supporters? In my experience, uh, often uh, what's changed is the people offering support directly, uh, what they need has changed. It isn't really about the individual. So for example, this gentleman who lost his grandfather, well, his dad lost his dad. His mom la lost her favorite father-in-law. He had sisters and brothers who lost their grandfather. He had aunts and uncles who lost a brother. Uh, so often people that were there and available to him, now they had a huge load on their hearts and they weren't quite as available to him as they had been. It really, building support for him meant building support for them. A woman named Jean Clark said years ago, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, she said, a person's needs are best met by people whose needs are met. And in my experience, often people who are offering support to individuals directly, they're not paying attention to the things they most need. If you want to be there and be helpful to someone, especially someone with complex behavior problems, you have to make sure your feet are on the ground and that you're okay. Now, all of this leads to what I call seven questions to build a support plan. And I want you to notice just how different these questions are from the ones we typically ask. Typically, we're asking, how do we make this behavior go away? How do we stop the person from engaging in these behaviors? These are different questions. The first, you won't be surprised by any, I suppose, is how can we help the person to broaden and expand his or her relationships? All of us are going to lose people we love, but if we're surrounded by a network of support, we have some immunity against the pain and suffering of loss. Um, the problem for too many people I meet in my practice is they don't have very many people at all to depend on, and helping them to broaden and expand their relationships is absolutely critical to their well-being in a world in which you just have to say goodbye to people from time to time. The next question you might ask is, how can we help the person to achieve a sense of safety and well-being? 
And here I want to emphasize that it's really about well-being. It's not simply how can we help the person to be free of things like an abs abscess to their teeth or um, how can we help the person's sinuses to be better, but how can we help them to achieve a sense of well-being? Uh, many people I meet in my practice are not eating well, they're not sleeping well, uh, they feel terrible in their bodies, and it's hard to do well in the world when you don't feel well in your bodies. Another thing I would just add to this area is that often medical practitioners, uh, they were trained uh, to make their diagnoses based on verbal reports from their uh, patients, and sometimes people without a formal means of communication can't get that information across. They can't tell anybody how they feel in their bodies, and sometimes you have to be like a detective who works backwards based on some of the symptoms you can outwardly see. The next question you might ask in building a support plan for the person is, how can we help the person to find more joy in ordinary, everyday community places? Uh, my experience, as I mentioned before, is that often people's lives are without joy. Helping this gentleman who lost his grandfather meant helping him to connect with other people who loved fishing, and it meant a lot of different things, but it meant having things to look forward to. When, when we have look, things to look forward to, we can get through the toughest of times. The problem for a lot of people who use our support system is they don't have much to look forward to. Another question you might ask is, how can the person have a better sense of power and control in their life? Helping this gentleman to find other communication allies is critical. But when you take away control from people, one of the things they naturally do is act out. And lots of people I meet in my practice have very little control over anything in their life. They can't decide what to wear in the morning. Uh, they can't decide what to eat for breakfast. They're often living in situations where they're living with people they don't choose to live with. It might be based on their diagnoses. We have, for example, group homes and group residences for people with problem behaviors, which makes absolutely no sense to take people who have no social skills and put them together with other people who have no social skills, and then when they don't get along, put them on behavior plans or give them psychotropic medications. Uh, it, when I spend time with people and I realize how little power, real power they have in the world, I'm not surprised that they act out. I'm surprised they don't act out more often. Uh, another critical question is to ask, how can we help the person to make a contribution to others? It is critically important to our social brain that we be needed by others. What we know about people who are needed by others is that they are way more likely to live longer and happier lives, to get sick less often, etc. The species needs us to be needed. Uh, when this gentleman, of course, couldn't any longer help his grandfather to load the boat into the water, uh, the people who loved him helped him find ways to keep his grandfather's memory alive. So they went through, I remember these photo boxes of photos, and he put together these wonderful photo albums that he made into these beautiful books using his Apple computer uh, that were then given to other family members. Uh, he has become the sort of caretaker, caretaker of his grandfather's memory. He makes sure the gravesite is right. He s makes sure there's a party celebrating his grandfather's birthday every year. And uh, it, it, he takes a great deal of pride now in being the one who holds his grandfather's memory for the family. It's a, an important contribution he makes to everyone in the family. But it's critical that we help people to go from this role of being the needy ones to being people who are depended upon by their social community. Next, we can help the person to learn valued skills, things like better ways to communicate, more efficient and effective ways of communicating. Coping skills are critical. By the way, on my website, there's several handouts that you might find helpful. One is called Upside Down and Inside Out, Supporting a Person in Crisis. And I'll just tell you that there's a bunch of ideas there for how you can help people with all of these questions we're talking about, but also for teaching people coping skills, which I think are, is often missing in people's lives. And finally, the seventh question of this support plan is, how can we better support the person's supporters? As I mentioned, um, often the people who are 
delivering support every day, who are part of the person's life every day, they're not getting their own needs met. And if, as Jean Clark said, a person's needs are best met by people whose needs are met. So if you can build right into the individual support plan, support for the people that are showing up for them in their life each and every day, in my experience, it's more likely that it's all going to work and it's more likely people will follow through on your recommendations. So it's with that I'll leave you. Um, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I know that there is a way that people, after hearing the broadcast, can submit questions, and I'll do my best to uh, post some answers uh, um, uh, online for you. Um, I want to thank, again, the folks from the Autism Center for Excellence for having me here, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.